What outfit do I want to wear? Um, I don't know. Something that makes you look like a trash panda, I guess. Is this trash panda enough for you? I can't even see it, but I see it. Get out of here. You fucking... <laughs> Get out of here. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, bye. Yeah, bye. Can we turn it off my lights, you bitch? Wait, did I turn off your lights? You turned off a light. Oh, no. How? How did I turn off a light? You pressed A in front of it. Thank oh, you. oh, that's the, that's, oh, I see. I'm trying to, like, change my outfit. I didn't realize you had a light just hanging there. You got God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> yes, I have a lot of lighting. It took a long time to figure out how to make this look right. God damn it. Where is a lightingless place I can uh, fucking corner. change? Oh, there you go. Hmm. <laughs> I worked really hard on making this room. <laughs> We'll go with the daddy outfit for this podcast. Oh my god, what the fuck? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> god. What the hell is <laughs> daddy outfit? There's two types of people. <laughs> and be sure to like and smash the that subscribe smash it. button. <laughs> smash it. Smash it like Vice smash Caitlyn off screen. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying it's canon that they smashed off screen. I'm just saying it's my head canon they smashed off screen. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome. <laughs> Hope you guys are doing good. Just uh, coming to you from the new podcast room. The new Pan Acia podcast room. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> oh, fuck. My switch is not in my hands. Emote. Need to emote. Need to emote. <laughs> All right. And uh, <laughs> the the only way I found to stop emoting is to um like walk forward on the controller and then you just kind of like bump. <laughs> but I want to emote. <laughs> I've been deciding whether or not I want to have um the sound from the switch on. Because there's yeah. no music in here. But, but we can hear the emote but sounds. But you can hear the, yeah, you can hear the emote sounds. Mm. And so I mm. thought maybe that'd be a, an interesting thing to keep in. So I'm going to keep them in for now. Let us know if uh, the emote sounds are too loud or whatever. I, I don't have them too loud on my, uh, my meter, but I don't know. You guys let me know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just here uh, appreciating my sick fade. <laughs> do they need to make there's there's a haircut that they're missing in this mm -hmm. that would more accurately describe my hairstyle and um it would just be like this fade but kind of a consistent all the way up an actual proper fade yeah yeah they don't have any like actual real fades in this game because mm -hmm. they have like a very distinct style of like having a certain length on the side of the head and a certain length on the top of the head so you don't actually get like a proper fade yeah yeah like neither of ours are technically fades they're just buzzed sides with a top yeah yeah i don't know but uh <laughs> i uh i worked on this podcast room for like seven hours god damn yeah. But you got to do it on stream, so it was content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just, I don't know if, if it was worth it. <laughs> I like it. I think it was worth it. Yeah, a lot of people have been complimenting it, and it's, it, it's one of those things where my brain's going, hmm, <laughs> hmm, when's the prank? <laughs> Wait, where's prank? <laughs> da, da, you got prank. Da, 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 da. Got brain. So Koytao's voice actress is the best English VA. Mm. Actually, that's a lie. Koi Dao exists. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, Koi Koi Dao exists. I'm sorry. That was a lie. I'm sorry, Koi. I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and the best the best Genshin voice actor in general is Korean Kazaha. <laughs> Lol. Yeah, fair. Um I mean, well, shit, since we're already on Genshin topic. Uh, yeah. The, the only thing I had uh, for Genshin today was uh, I was on Twitter uh, two days ago, yesterday. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I checked trending, you know. Yeah. And uh, I saw trending in Genshin Impact. Mommy. And uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? And so um, I looked and apparently... <laughs> Uh, Mihoyo teased their new, uh, their new character. They're, they've uh, teased a few of them. Yeah, well, uh, like, they've, I, I was just kind of scrolling through Twitter yesterday, and, like, I noticed there were multiple, they've teased multiple. Like, they've teased at least two or three now, I think. Uh, uh I think just yesterday they teased, like, another one that is, like, this pastel goth chinese goth lolita with a spear character yeah yeah i'm just but yeah there is there is a ice spear mommy yeah yeah god they're adding so many polearm characters uh shen hey i i don't know uh probably shen her okay i would assume but like i it's always hard to tell because this is an actual opinion so you don't have like intonation marks Okay. So it's kind of just guessing, but if it was like completely flat intonation, it'd probably be Shen He. Shen, Shen He? Shen He? Yeah, Shen He. Some people in chat probably. are saying Shen He. But either way, either way, uh, yeah, uh, Shen he. Mommy was trending under Genshin Impact, and uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts? I'm I mean, not telling you how I'm spelling that word, but do you have any thoughts? Any thoughts? <laughs> um... In my opinion, this is kind of just a reaction to this is this is probably Mahoyo finally starting to be a little proactive mm -hmm. towards the whole leaking thing. Yeah. I, and, like, and actually I'm really yeah. appreciative towards that. Me too. Cuz like I mean, part of the reason why like the whole like leaks the whole like leaks footage or like leaks culture stuff is so strong is because we don't get enough information early enough from uh Mahoyo. Mhm. Mm and so, like, it's actually nice to see that we're getting something at least early on, that they're preempting something. I mean, ultimately, I don't think, even if they, like, start releasing character abilities and stuff early on, I don't think, like, it'll kill some of the leak market. It'll, like, kill some of the leak market, but, like, it won't actually kill it because at the end of the day, a lot of what people like about the data leaks is that they can actually get, like, numbers, right? But that's a, probably a small percentage of the leak market. Honestly, I feel like if they were to release, like, character kits and character stuff, like, a banner ahead or something, or, like, as soon as they end up being in the code, in the data, it would kill a lot of the leak market. Because, mm -hmm. like, theory always... crafters and shit care about the numbers, but most people don't. Something I've always wondered about um, leaks is, in general, wh why do people care? about leaks uh because they're hyped about shit so my my thing about it is, is you know people say oh well I, I need to save for the character i need to you know mm -hmm. farm for the character before it comes out as well as say well why are you wasting all that time and resources on farming for a character that might be you know jean lee level bad or you know yan or uh what's her name i mean realistically Bo girl i feel like <laughs> bad on launch yeah yep. No. Like, I think real. I think realistically, part of the reason is, I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like most people who wants to farm beforehand, like if they aren't like content creators or like theor or like theory crafter whales or whoever, like who you know are pull who need to pull regardless. Mm -hmm. If they if they're interested in beforehand, they're probably a waifu puller. Well, okay. Well, then if they're a waifu puller, then I mean, are you just pulling on random banners just because? If you're a white I mean, puller, then why aren't you just waiting until the banner comes out? I mean, because because this game has a lot of waifus. I know, but I mean, are you? I guess I've never I've never well, heard a pop. proper argument that's coming that's come from anybody where it they're able to actually justify. I mean, fair. Well, like, let's say for example, right, like the Hu Tao banner, right? Right. Let's say like you're like me and Hu, Hu Tao is a waifu for you, right? Mm-hmm. But then a new character that's unannounced, let's say Shen He, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say like I see her and I'm like, 
ooh, step on me, mommy, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, ooh, I need her. Like, I need, I need this character. Mm -hmm. And she's a waifu. But the thing is, if they didn't release this now, I might have... I might have or I might have burned all of my stuff on the Hu Tao banner and then seen this and been like, well shit, if I had known she was coming up, I would have not pulled on this Hu Tao banner and saved up. Cause this game has a lot of waifus, and for most play most waifu pullers, I would assume, there's probably not like a single top waifu. Especially as they're releasing new characters. So you mean you mean in your case where you already own Hu Tao? No, like, I, let's say, I'm just saying if I was, like, a random, oh, like, a yeah. random free-to-play or low-to-play pa player or something, and I have very limited pulling power. Okay. Like, I'm, I would be like, well, do I want to burn my up to 30, uh, 320,000 uh, Prima Gems on, or 32,000, sorry? I was going to say, 320,000, uh, yeah, no, you were yeah. not a free-to-play? 32,000, like, Prima Gems I have saved up on trying to get Hu Tao or Hu Tao C1 or something. But now that I know Shen He is coming out, I'm like, okay, well, may maybe I'm going to save for her because I like I like her style. I like how she looks. I want her to step on me. Mm. No, I don't know. Yeah. Then the... Uh... Just, like, because, like, part of the problem is, like, re until now, they haven't really been releasing much about new characters at all. Mm -hmm. Until, like until like right before that banner comes up yeah and having a little bit more forethought gives i mean that that that's part of the reason why they haven't done it right because when people have that kind of like that future vision to see oh there's a new waifu i might care about more coming up they save their primo gems instead of being double baited by waifus and like feeling like they have to spend money because they want this other waifu that came up mm. so like i mean from a business standpoint i understand why mahoyo took the original strategy they did of only of only announcing characters like very like very close to when the banner is about to come out mm. or very close to when their the patch for them is going to come out or whatever right mm -hmm. but like i said to me this kind of just screams as like a reaction to the whole leaking community thing mm. just you know well if the leakers are if like let, like if shen he and like uh yun jin are gonna be in the game files for 2.3 and they can't prevent that they might as well announce them beforehand before yeah, the leakers yeah, they're, they're, like hey look at these new characters in the game files yeah they're pulling you know? a thanos yeah exactly fine i'll do it myself <laughs> basically uh, so uh, the other thing about shen hey or shen ha or shen hu whatever uh until just somebody until somebody gives me a what is pulling mommy <laughs> okay uh you can <laughs> uh, apparently it got some bad reactions on, uh, Reddit because, you know, Reddit is a pile of whatever. Um, yep. A and, uh, they, bad they, did a, they did a character redraw, uh, where they gave her for lack of better terms, real clothes. Lol. Yeah. They, they gave her like a skirt and everything, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was over sexualized. Is like, I, mean, I mean, you're playing Genshin is Impact. Is it, though? <laughs> you're playing Genshin Impact. Every single one of those characters serves a, <laughs> serves this, a fetish. This, like, I'm looking at her outfit. It's not really over-sexualized. She's just wearing, like, a very... She's just wearing, like... A sheer... Like, a sheer body A sheer suit. body suit. Like, With that's... Panty lines. And it doesn't really thigh, have. I mean, thigh windows. what do you mean by what do you mean by panty lines? I mean, there's like a clear silhouette on her crotch that's supposed to like represent a panty line. I guess, but this you could also argue like the top half of that silhouette's just because it's a stomach window. And it also it also looks like she's got that um that uh. Oh, uh, maybe it's because tummy like, corruption tattoo. Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe it's because like I'm gothy and like sheer and lacy clothing isn't really weird to me in any way. But like this doesn't like this screams like as one of the uh, one of like the less slutty outfits we've had, honestly. <laughs> like to me, maybe it's because like it's maybe it's because like you know bodysuit stuff and like sheer stuff and fishnet stuff and all of that is kind of normalized to me. Yeah, but like this doesn't in any way scream slutty to me i mean i don't care this is yeah. it's, it's a it's a waifu game this yeah every exactly. single character in this game serves to like be someone's fetish yep 
I don't know. It doesn't really scream that slutty to me personally, but like, shrug. <laughs> mm hmm. But, uh. <laughs> and then the other one, yeah. I guess I hadn't seen this one yet, but. This, uh. You. No, wait. What's her name? Yoon Jin? Yoon Jin? Yeah. Is that. Wait, is that her name? I'm trying to. Yoon Jin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Geo Claymore, I guess. You or, uh, no. Polearm. Geo Polearm. Yeah, Geo Polearm. Uh, I don't know. I mean... I'm guessing defense scaling in some way, because that seems to be the clear direction they want to take Geo moving forward, is defense scaling. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's really nothing... They're Polearm I mean, characters, so... She's, a, she's like a bubblegum pastel goth. Yeah. Lita, which is... A neat aesthetic and i'm kind of glad to see it i also don't personally like it yeah but like it's neat to see them using the aesthetic yeah because there's definitely a pretty strong underrepresentation of like bubblegum pastel goths in like a lot of anime media and stuff it's seems it seems i just got, i honestly can't even recall like a single other character in any like anime or anime game that actually has a past uh, a bubblegum pastel goth I don't know. It, it it actually reminds me more of um like a a southern United States like a Texas style outfit. It looks like she's got cowboy boots and that dress reminds me more of um like a line dancing skirt than goth yeah. skirt, but that's just me. I mean, it. Well, it's a gothic Lolita dress. It's I mean, a, it like the. It very much is like a gothic Lolita dress to me. If but you like say said, so, she doesn't have it, bloomers or anything. Yeah. Like there's usually under uh fluff. In a gothic yeah. style skirt. In in I well, don't with know. a Lolita with a gothic Lolita one at least. I yeah. don't know. I think for me, it's largely like the aesthetic and like the pastel contrasting with like the dark purple. Yeah, a lot of it makes me feel makes me think Gothic Lolita because part of the thing too is like without like the lack of bloomers and stuff. There's also there's also a lot of like, cha like a lot of like uh, not Chinese necessarily, but like Asian aesthetic mm -hmm. attached to it, like with the like with the dress tassels and the printing used on it and everything, right? And the central waistband and all that stuff, like so. I guess the lack of bloomers didn't surprise me because I would take that as part of like the Asian influence mm -hmm. on the dress style. But yeah, you might be right. I mean, the dress might not be a hard gothic Lolita one. I've never really been that into that side of gothy stuff. I, I, so, I've never really been into goth in general. I think goth is I think goth is the weakest form of fashion. Lol. <laughs> I would. <laughs> disagree but also understand where you come from because <laughs> there's all because there's definitely a like a lot of there there are a lot of different like gothic subcultures and gothic like subsets of aesthetics mm -hmm. and the vast majority of them in kind of a lot of the mainstream i are the really fucking boring ones <laughs> <laughs> like you've got like casual goths baby bats and like and probably like uh corp goth are probably like the ones you see a lot <laughs> but you don't really see much of like out of like rivet heads or like or like or like victorian goths or like some of these more interesting well put together outfits largely because a lot of that shit's really expensive um but yeah i don't know i see generally when i see goth i see black denim with black combat boots with Either like a black wife beater or a black uh hoodie. Yeah, maybe see, that's like maybe like a black button up. Yeah, that would probably be considered something more like a casual goth aesthetic, although if you had like the black button up that might be leading to like corp goth. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I remember at one point I looked through like fucking what was it like I was looking through uh Someone had put together, like, this little cute, like, chibi character guide to, like, a bunch of different goth aesthetics. And there were, like, fucking 40, there were, like, fucking 40 things of it mm -hmm. for it. 
there's like a lot of like subsects of the aesthetic at the very least that exist and a lot of them are very interesting but like yeah most of the stuff you see is like very basic shit but i'm wearing black <laughs> yeah my Basically. uh my aesthetic is and then you've got like baby bat hot topic aesthetic mine is uh hoodies for every occasion even in the summer uh always jeans and uh vans that's that's it <laughs> i mean fair but at the end of the day not everyone needs to like what what is what is the what style. is the designated title for my fashion jinx? <laughs> uh, white boy. <laughs> uh, I don't give a fuck, white boy. I guess. <laughs> I mean, if I had to give, if I had to like give like an actual like I'm I'm not a huge fashion guy, right? I just like I just like gothic style. So, like, I don't know that much about this kind of shit. And even with gothic style, like, I'm at best a dabbler, right? Are, like, are you at I'm best a dabbler? A dabbler. Like, There's no I'm dabby mode like, in Animal Crossing and there needs to be. Jenny has described my, uh, my, has described my style before as, like, gothic Yakuza chic. Because <laughs> I really like wearing, like, dress shirts with, like, rose patterns or, like, things like that on it, right? Yeah. Um, but I also like wearing my waistcoats and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm pretty much always wearing some combination of black or red or black and white or something along those lines. <laughs> um, but like, I'd probably say that my style is very casual goth with a hint of Victorian, just cause I really like waistcoats and certain Victorian things I can afford. And I'd be leaning much more into a Victorian goth aesthetic if I could fucking afford it. But that shit's really expensive if you want like decent quality stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, you want stuff that isn't, like, a costume piece that you can wear, like, ten times <laughs> before it starts fraying or some shit. <laughs> so, like, but yeah, I don't know. I From what you just described, I'd probably say you're something like a casual comfy core. <laughs> casual comfy core. <laughs> we can just call it white boy. We can just like, call it white boy. Like, well, it's because, like, co comfy core, as I understand, is, like, you know, like, kind of really going balls hard deep with, like, the comfy aesthetic. And it sounds like you've just got like a casual comfy aesthetic. I mean, I'd wear stuff like this if I looked good in it. I think you'd look good in it, but you know, some some nice little button up shirt kind of thing. Yeah. Unfortunately. I mean, I've, honestly, everyone looks good in a button up shirt. It's just a matter of finding one that fits properly, which for some body proportions is actually really difficult. Yeah, it's it's hard. Um, it's really I don't know. I've never shopped actually. at a big and tall store, but I know that like if I want something to fit in the shoulders right, it's yep. usually too short. And if I want yep. something to Same issue. fit in the torso right, it the shoulders go down to like my fucking. Butt. Yeah, I'm kind of built like a triangle. Yeah. So like. So like medium, like most like mediums will fit my current waist because I'm a little because I'm a little thicker than I used to be. Mm -hmm. Will fit my current waist well, but they'll be too tight in the shoulders and the chest. And then on top of that, most American most non-American mediums, uh, because American mediums tend to be a little bit longer, but most non-American mediums tend to be too short as well. Mm -hmm. And if I lift my arms up even a bit, they'll like rise above my waistband and like show off my belly. Mm -hmm. Um, lodgers, lodgers fit my chest and sometimes fit my shoulders, but are far, but even like large slim fits, uh, tend to be like, not have the, enough tapering for my waist. And then like, the larger sides of lodgers tend to actually fit my shoulders properly. My shoulders are like, significantly wider than the rest of my body for some fucking reason. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for me to find shirts that fit well, but I will say like, if you think you don't look good in dress shirts, if you get an actual properly measured tailored dress shirt, you'll probably change your opinion on that. Cause I do think a dress shirt is one like it's it's like the whole meme of like everyone looks good in the pro in like a well fitted suit thing, but like everyone looks good in the well in the well fitted dress shirt. It's just every, a matter of finding one that fits. Every man, women too, probably. I mean, yeah, <laughs> but I also like I also like 
butches. So well, I'm I'm, I was, no, I was gonna say, I was gonna say I was, uh, something. My, something my uh, I've always been told in my life is every man needs a properly fitted white shirt. Yep, a, I don't agree. A, white, a, a, no, 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 because there's there's something about like a perfectly crisp, clean white Night, shirt, like lightly starched so it has minimal wrinkles sure yeah. right right like every man looks good and it, it doesn't matter your size your body whatever is, is, is something think... is something that i was always told growing up is every every yeah. man needs a perfectly clean white t-shirt i i don't agree with white just because like white dress shirts are kind of i don't know at least maybe it's because i'm in the industry no no no, no, like, no, no. White dress not dress shirt we're talking just like oh, a t-shirt a t-shirt Every man needs a perfectly crisp, clean, white T-shirt. I don't really necessarily agree with that. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like white is white shirt T-shirts can be problematic with skin tone. Like I don't like white T-shirts on me. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of bring out too much tan in my complexion. I think. You're kind of, you're kind of tan. I mean, you're tanner than me. <laughs> yeah, I am, but, but like, that's it, not hard. <laughs> It like yeah, and it like pushes me from like kind of tan to looking pretty tan. Like there's certain like colors and like outfits that make me go from like looking like a slightly tan Chinese guy to like I might be Filipino. <laughs> I was gonna say you look nothing like your character in real life. Oh no, completely no. <laughs> is, I mean, is, is it even close. <laughs> Is there a Jinx's Instagram we need to evaluate? I mean, if you go on my, like, Twitter, if you go on my Twitter account, the banner for my Twitter account is one of the more recent pictures of me. Speaking of uh, shirtless guys uh, <laughs> and shirts that don't fit, apparently uh, Ido has a beatbox, I guess, so that's kind of cool. Oh, neat. Yeah, I can't, apparently he, he beatboxes at some point. Is what somebody was saying earlier. I'm just I'm just imagining that samurai shampoo scene now with like the samurai walking around with a beatboxer behind them the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love beatboxing, dude. I wish I was way better at it. I've seen some people who are just so good, and I'm just, dude, how do you do that? But uh, yeah, the other it's thing about you can learn, but. Especially if you have good if you have good rhythm, you can learn it, but it does take a long time to learn. No, it's I mean, get, like, really you know, good. it's just the the rhythm thing is fine. You know, it's like you just got the, but it's there's other sounds that people can make that just. Oh yeah, like but like. I feel like like any musical instrument, learning the beatbox is just a matter of learning to do it. It's just not easy. Yeah, you feel like, man, I can't even begin to process how they make some of the sounds but but um beatboxing ito everybody keeps drawing ito like he's this huge bear of a man huge rippling abs and like huge but he's muscles really not. like no dude i just people keep drawing ito like he's barely big enough to be called a twink <laughs> That dude's oh, like in-game model him. does not look anything. Like yeah, although I think that's I think part of that's just that that's like the adult male model. I, I know, but like, like... We, we haven't gone a true beefcake, and I don't know if we ever will. But that's what I'm saying, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even look like that in-game. Co yep. harder, dude. Shrug. I mean, now that I understand, he has like the that he has the whole like. He has, like, the whole delinquent anarchy thing going on, not the whole, like, Yakuza anarchy thing going on. Like, I feel like it makes sense. Uh. <laughs> but, yeah. All right. Well, you look like I guess you're, that's... <laughs> you look like you're from <laughs> Yakuza. <laughs> Lol. I mean, this is my daddy outfit. I, I, I wouldn't call that daddy. I'd call that you look like you're from Yakuza. <laughs> nah, see, like... So at some point for a podcast, we'll do a tour of uh, my island mm -hmm. so you can see what's up. But like the vague backstory is that like Jenny is the actual mayor of the island, right? Uh huh. And I'm just the rich partner who who came to the island to, to like evade the authorities for tax evasion. Uh huh. And so, so, I, have an, so I have like a ridiculously expensive ass house. 
I have a I have like a gigantic just like mass production orchard of fruits in front of my house. I have a fucking waterfall built behind like a three tier waterfall built behind my house, and I have a giant section of the like of the island that is just devoted to pat to solar to a solar grid and internet access that I then give to the islanders in the town in exchange for more money. I'm the rich motherfucker living next to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the. <laughs> it's quite the backstory you've got. Mine, mine is uh, I landed on an island and Tom, I owe Tom Nook money, and so we're making an island. <laughs> you know <laughs> the plot of the game. <laughs> no, I'm just evading taxes, enjoying the enjoying the island lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez alright well I guess that's enough <laughs> that very brief Genshin topic turned out to be like fucking 30 minutes or something so. no I mean I had <laughs> stuff I wanted to talk about yeah I did too the, the, when I want to talk about Genshin I want to talk about Genshin it's just you know there's, there's not, not much to talk about to talk yeah. about with Genshin there really yeah. isn't you can only rehash really the isn't. same fucking math formula so many times. Yep. Uh, but you wanted to talk about Arcane. I also wanted Yeesh. to talk about Arcane, but you also Arcane, wanted to talk about Arcane. Real good. Because Arcane, real good. So I guess from this point on, uh, spoilers, yeah. we're going to be talking about Arcane. If you haven't seen Arcane, stop watching the video on YouTube or hop out of the Twitch stream or mute it or something because, uh, spoilers. There are going to be spoilers for Arcane. We're going to talk about all nine episodes. Spoilers. This is your last spoiler warning. Okay, let's talk about Arcane. <laughs> one, w one more spoiler warning. Spoilers. There you go. <laughs> Beware. There are spoilers. God damn it. I'm allowed to make that voice in Chinese. <laughs> God damn it, Jinx. All right. Um, yeah, no, um, Arcane is really good, and I'm leading into this slow, just in case people didn't realize they're spoilers. Lol. Arcane Arcane is really good. Um I don't, Arcane I don't is think you really need to good. I don't think you need to have played League of Legends to enjoy it. Jenny Jenny hasn't. In fact, Jenny hates League of Legends. Like Jenny has like a vendetta against League of Legends. Right. And she really enjoyed Arcane. Right. So it's a fantastic piece of media and you don't need any pre knowledge going in. In fact, it's arguable the experience will be better if you don't have any pre knowledge going in, because a lot of the Twists and turns and other things with characters might be more impactful if you don't already know how they're gonna end up, like, in the actual lore. Mm, maybe. But there's also moments that, like, there's also moments that you won't necessarily get because yeah. you aren't part of it. Like, you know, when when Victor yeah, reveals when he says, himself oh, for the name? first time. Victor. And you're okay, supposed so to go, wait, oh, Did you have shit. subtitles on? Yes, I did. Because that moment got ruined for yep. me because in, like, the no. previous yep. episode, it yep. said, like, Victor yep. or something, something. Yep. Like, God damn it, you just ruined the reveal. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I turned subtitles off same after thing that. With, same, thing with, same thing with Singe. They, I mean, it was pretty obvious that it was Singe, but, like, they also ruined it by having the same thing happen with Singe. Oh, well, I, yeah, I turned the subtitles off after it said, you know, Victor says this. I'm like, wait, he's Victor? <laughs> Fuck, no more subtitles. It, like, that's the only two times that happens is with Victor and with Singed, but still, it's like, what the fuck, Netflix? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that, uh... Yep. So I would, uh... Well, I guess you're... It's spoilers already, I would say. I would suggest everybody turn off the subtitles. <laughs> I will turn off the subtitles for season two, I would say. Um. What's up? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely gonna turn off subtitles for season two, just because I don't want more. Because Netflix has already proven that they can't be trusted with the subtitles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, no, uh, great choice for a setting, I think. Um, yeah, Zorn, I, um, I Zorn do, I do and Piltover is one of the more interesting ones. I think sure. they explored more Zon than they did uh, Piltover, but then again, Zon's probably the more interesting Area. I'm honestly on the opinion they didn't explore either nearly enough, but that's a whole... I don't think they explored the setting enough. They had personally. nine episodes. What are they going to do? I mean, they had nine episodes, but there are like hour and a half long movies that do a better job with like setting explanations than they did. Like, I, I, 
I get uh, why they didn't there's dive also into it. Like, probably the I expectation wanted to know. that a majority of people already know what these settings are. Yes, but also they retcon a bunch of shit. What where do they retcon? Because you said that they retcon stuff, but I what do... So like there's a bunch of character retcons, that's a different thing, but setting retcon wise, they retcon a bunch of shit about like the thing is like I know about the lore but of Zorn and like the way they're presenting it is very different from the actual league law on Zorn from both like the league now, wiki and like what they talked about with Jana's backstory in like on um, like the right official pages and stuff. What now what what lore because you didn't haven't played League in a decade. I haven't, but I also like after because I basically after I watched Arcane, I was like, this doesn't line up with what I remember about Zorn and like Piltover. I read into it again. Mm-hmm. Like two days ago i was like oh yeah no this doesn't line up (laughs) uh the only thing i know for sure that they retconned um was by how she got the gauntlets yeah Uh, it was pretty close except uh in vi's lore page uh initially i don't know if they've changed it since then but when i read the lore uh she got them from a mining facility like she yeah they broke into an old abandoned mine and found the gauntlets yeah, there's, there's quite a few retcons character-wise, but I think the big thing about, like, the setting is that, like... And this is, like, one of those things where maybe they could try to twist it in Season 2 to kind of fit better into the lore. But basically, Zorn was always called Zorn originally. Like, it, it was a it used to be part of the Shirima Empire back in the day. Mm. And then, the reason the Undercity exists and is so polluted... Uh, and that zone, what is now modernly called zone, is so polluted, is because they were like, "Hey, we like money. We want more money. Let's just bl- let's just dynamite a goddamn canal from the northern sea to the southern sea, so we can have a trade route coming through here." And they did that, and they fucked up really bad because they used a shitload of chemtech explosives, and then that basically create that basically hit something like a gas pocket or something, and caused this massive like horrible explosion that just caved out a chunk of the land down, and then filled it with just like all of the fucking chemtech factories and stuff that were above, and just dumped toxins and chemical byproducts and shit into like this giant little fucking uh giant ass trench they made basically. Mm. Um. And that's the reason, and that's the canon, as I understand it, at least from my reading into it, that's the canon reason why Zorn is so polluted and why the Undercity is down there and everything. And then Piltover is a relatively new addition to Zorn, uh, a relatively new addition to Zorn. Uh, and there was never the whole, like, this is Piltover and there's the Undercity and Pilt and like the upper city of Piltover and Zorn. Zone came first. Zone didn't come second. And the way they're presenting it in Arcane is that Zone isn't even a thing yet. Like Zone is like they're trying to make Zone a thing, even though Zone came before Piltover. Mm-hmm. That's actually Janna's entire backstory. Is that like Janna is this wind goddess, right? And like the sailors in Zone uh, used to worship her and like ask her for like you know good luck so they wouldn't fucking die out in sea, right? Right. She's a wind goddess. And then when the horrible cataclysmic event happens. And, like, all the people down there basically got just fucking, just uh, basically, like, in the middle of a fucking nuclear dump site. They uh, prayed to Janna to save them, and she showed up and basically pushed away all the noxic, noxic, noxic fumes and everything like that and saved these people's lives, which is why in Zone there is a huge cult that worships Janna and wears, I think it's blue sparrow medallions or something. Okay. Uh, worshiping Janna, and that's why Janna is, like, canon in the setting is because she showed up to save these Zornites, and she still chills in Zorn, canonically. <laughs> um, so, like, there's just a bunch, like, it's one of those things where maybe they can kind of, like, twist it, right? And maybe, like, in the next, next season, they'll talk a bit more about how this place used to be Zorn, but then, like, Piltover took over, and then, you know, and then, like, they stopped being Zornites, and they started being, like, the lower class of the Piltover ruling class or whatnot. Like, they don't go... They don't go enough into the background and setting for us to say this is necessarily a hard retcon. They could maybe twist into it, but it just doesn't really line up with the lore they've established, which is also kind of understandable because a lot of League lore ends up being like that. They kind I, of have, yeah, like, I was going to say, I don't care yeah, they have, like, the mo- most of the League yeah. lore is barely interconnected anyways. I mean, Shaco has like one line of lore. He's a clown. Yep. You know? But like, I the, mean, like the, uh, the the joke, the running joke right now is that 
fucking monkey uh from arcane jinx's monkey thing has more lore than shaco does right now yeah and like i don't personally mind it that much because like i mean my my the ideal thing for me would be for riot to just come out and say hey all that other shit not nah, what happened in arcane is canon all, all that other shit whatever what happened in arcane is canon because like they, as I understand it, they have a bit of, like, the DC and Marvel issue where, like, you know, they have all of these different comics and, like, short stories and stuff to, like, establish in, like, the lore for League of Legends. But they're all written by different people. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's kind of why, like, it seems like stuff might be retconning or inconsistent with each other all the time. is because they have different people writing these things. They, um, they also have stupid people writing them sometimes. Lol. Seraphine! <coughs> and there's also just a big issue that, like, what was it, like eight or nine years back, they had the huge lore rewrite where they actually tried to make, like, a consistency in the setting. Uh -huh. Where, you know, instead of just every character just having random backstory stuff and no, like, nation attributes and no political related shit and whatnot, they are like, okay, these characters are all Freljord characters. These characters are all Zorn characters, all Piltover characters. All uh, Void characters, all Noxian characters, all Demacia characters, right. and like actually made a proper map and everything, and tried to kind of integrate the law into like a consistent universe, right? Because mm -hmm. before that point, League was literally just like a fucking ma mosh pit of, hey, what's a cool character concept? Cool, let's put that in there and give them a vague backstory. Mm -hmm. But since then, still, there's just been like inconsistencies with the lore and retconning and stuff that happens. And I'm kind of hoping Arcane might also might become like a push for them to just kind of establish, hey, this is the actual canon. Yeah. Cause I mean, for like for like the lore background stuff that they put for like characters for like the actual game, it doesn't matter that much, right? Like very few people are gonna care about the whole internal consistency. But once you start doing like media like shows and movies and stuff in it, that kind of becomes more important. So I'm hoping that it kind of pushes them to actually build a fully consistent lore for the setting. You know, I I haven't looked up if there's any League books, you know, like Halo has novels. Right. And a lot of the lore in Halo comes from the novels. Um, yeah, I've heard that, yeah. Um, I don't know if yeah, League Master has Chief any... actually talks a lot more in the novels from what I've heard. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the, the, the running joke uh, is lore accurate Spartans. <laughs> Yep, lore, lore accurate Spartans will jump off of a warthog, uh, gr <laughs> you know, grab grab the the warthog turret as they're jumping off of it. Lol. Mow down fifty freaking elites. Um, throw a grenade on the floor. Jump off of the grenade. Uh, and grenade then elbow himself. slam from the top ring. Uh, you yeah. Know, like <laughs> sort of. Yeah, I get you. Like that's that's lore accurate Spartans. <laughs> I get you. Uh, but. but yeah, I think like so like ignore like other than the retcon stuff and whatnot. Like the retcon and settings. That's part of the reason why like I say like I feel like there's like this distinct uh, like this distinct like bell curve of enjoyment, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess even I guess it's more of a reverse bell curve of enjoyment. Uh, or maybe just maybe it's just a downward slope, but like. When you don't have any context to the setting like Jenny lacks, right? Like, you, you watch it and you're like, okay, cool, this is a cool setting. Cool, they're setting up, like, you know, very, like, understandable tropes. Okay, there's, a, un there's like, this oppressed underclass of undercity people. There's really rich people exploiting them. That's why they don't like each other, blah, blah, blah. Like, it, it, the, 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 set, the setting tropes are, like, easy enough to understand. You don't really need more background, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you're a League player, you get that, plus you also get, you know, the enjoyments of, like, the Victor reveal and all these little, like, nods they have to the games and whatnot in the in the show. And being like, ooh, I bet the Firelight leader is Echo. He's got a clock watch and stuff in that one scene, and, like, you know, they're, and it's, they're gonna have to bring Echo back at some point, right? Like, you get all those little moments. And then once you're like me and you're actually kind of into League lore, you're suddenly like, but the inconsistencies, but the retcons, what... T tell me more about why about why this is this way. Give me more setting info. <laughs> eh. like, I, mean, I still I love the of, show. I read but, a lot of yeah. League lore, and I still was just you know there was a, like I said the one that I caught was Vi, but I mean yeah. I don't know it's like I am fully aware I guess that 
for the past, I don't know, 12 years that this game has been out, they've really just not cared a lot about the lore. They constantly change lore. I mean, Poppy's Ooh. lore, for instance, one of my favorite characters, yeah. Poppy, her entire lore got changed. You know, yep. she used to be a ambassador from, I believe, Vandal City to Demacia. She yeah. was delivering a hammer to um some guy and then he ended up getting killed so she kept the hammer um now she's found a magical hammer and she's and she's the, she's the chosen trying, one of no, the hammer she's not the chosen one she's, oh, she's trying to find she's the, trying chosen, to find one, the right. chosen one but she probably is the chosen one yeah you know, and so yeah. like they change stuff all the time. So I went into it thinking, okay, I mean, well, who that, cares? That They're bothers me stuff. a little less because that's that's like that was that lore rewrite was part of her character redesign, though. Like that was more them updating the lore of like an old character that wasn't really consistently part of the universe before. Eh, I mean, the it's like when they the rework lore it, made I, sense. The, you know, the she war, was a I guess, emissary from Bandal City yeah. to Demacia. I mean, that's I guess. Let, how let is me that not part of the let universe? Me yeah, let me retract that second part because that's not correct. But I guess, like, what I'm saying is that, like, that was the lore rework was part of her character rework. Yeah, so, but like, I mean, you could yeah. have still kept that exact same lore with Poppy. Yeah. That she is an emissary from the Bandal City delivering a hammer to a guy in Demacia. But then the guy in Demacia, the general, you know, died. And so she kept the yeah. hammer. Like, that could have been the exact same thing. But they changed no, it because you. they just change stuff all the time. And it's whatever. Yep. I mean, it's whatever. Like, well, I guess that's the thing. I, I like, again, I haven't played League in a long time. And I've every, like, few months or year or two, I'll, like, dip my toe into some League lore just because I enjoy the lore in the mm -hmm. game a lot. Especially after they did that big rewrite eight, nine, whatever years ago. Who, fun story, I might I might actually know one of the guys responsible for that. Because I used to have a neighbor when I was living in uh like in the heart of downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Uh where this my neighbor basically I was chatting with him because he was also a gamer and he gave me like and a like gamer. he wanted to play he wanted to play Dota with me, but I wasn't a big fan of Dota because he actually preferred playing Dota. Uh but basically he was telling me how you know he was gonna be moving in the in like pretty soon because he got a job over at Riots and like he's as a senior writer over there and he was talking to me about how like his issue with the League of Legends lore is how in, is how there isn't like a consistent coherent universe with it. It's just a bunch of it's just like a grab bag of cool characters. And he wants and like if they really wanted to like make the writing and the lore better, they needed to build a consistent universe yeah. where all these things can exist, but it makes sense why they exist within like their own individual nations or settings or whatnot. Yeah, and like the political conflicts between them and all of that stuff. And then lo and behold, he moves over there, and then a few months later, the big lore rewrite happens. So. Maybe I know a guy. Maybe I used to live next to a guy who like was related to that. But mm. I don't know. Like I, I enjoy League lore quite a bit because I find it very interesting. And I was really excited about Arcane because the whole Jinx and Vi thing was, I feel like, intentionally not explored. And like even the Jinx and Vi being sisters thing, as I understand, until Arcane was never really no, fully it was never confirmed. confirmed. It was never fully confirmed. It no. was just like a fan theory based off of a single voice line Jinx has. Yeah. If you think um, I'm crazy, you should you should look at my is, sister. Yeah, you should meet my sister. Um, but like I guess like out of a lot of the characters in the game, Jinx is an interesting one to explore, in my opinion, because she's literally mania personified. Mm -hmm. But it's it but it is I guess it seems more interesting to me to explore how a person becomes that, mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, what's it called? Um, like how, like with Harley Quinn, at least like you know, original Harley Quinn, not new Harley Quinn, but like original Harley Quinn was basically, uh, was basically being a was basically like wh what is the term? Basically, uh, she was she was Stockholm uh, syndrome. <laughs> Yeah, basically, like, being abused by a partner, like, Stockholm Syndrome personified, right? Yeah. Like, that was the definition of her character, was the fact that she got so into... She, 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 was, a, she was a therapist who, was, who got so into the Joker's psychology, like, he became her entire world, basically. Right. And everything she did and everything she does with herself is to understand and please him better. Right. right. 
and like seeing that per that seeing that that seeing like understanding that backstory of the reason she's like this is because she got so in she was a therapist who got so invested in the joker's psychology that he became her entire world is an interesting way to look at that is an interesting way to understand that and so that's why i'm enjoying the whole thing with jinx um i don't know arcane really good show like really good show it's really well written um it's it, it, I, I I had no doubts it was going to be, you know, impressively produced because this is Riot we're talking about. Yeah, I think like, it's the same Riot's team that does teams. their music videos and stuff. So. Yeah, like Riot's media for, you know, the world's uh, videos and like KDA and like all this stuff have always been fucking on point. Like they they made a goddamn video game K-pop band that put out fucking like a shitload of actual bangers just to sell some skins. Like their media team's fucking great. <laughs> so I had no doubt it was going to be good on that end. I was not expecting the writing to be so good, though. I had, like, every episode had at least one moment where I went, oh, God, my feels. And, like, that doesn't happen to me a lot in TV shows. Yeah. Most shows have, like, a handful of uh, moment of scenes like that in their entire, like, two-plus season, like, runtime. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect them to do such a good job with just so many, like, oh my god, my feels moments in basically every episode. Yeah, I have, um, I was kind of talking about some things, and it's not even just the writing, because writing is whatever, but imagery is really hard to get down, I think, because anybody can write. A visual yeah. medium tends to be more difficult to create imagery with. Oh, yeah. Especially um, when you have, like, all of the components of the score, the, like, the voice acting, the environmental stuff, like, the actual things happening on screen, all that shit. And there was a together. scene uh, where Vi had crossed the bridge, and mm -hmm. she was laying Caitlyn down and looking back across the bridge, and it frames her face, and she's standing behind a gate. And the gates look like iron bars from prison. And it yep. split immediately, like right down the center of her face. And the side behind pr the bars is the side that she's got the tattoo on, all of yep. the cuts, the scars, the shaved side of her head. And then the side that's be uh, not behind bars is the side that's um, untouched, no scars, no uh, tattoos. And it's got her long hair on it. And yep. um, that. I mean, it was just a really good scene. And then it was immediately, it was preceded by uh, the Jinx Echo fight, which, okay, was can really just, good. And can reminded we just me talk of the, about uh, Echo's drip. <laughs> reminded me of the, <laughs> uh, uh, the Obito uh, Kakashi fight from Naruto. Oh, yeah. Where they is, were having uh, the, basically the same fight as they did when they were kids, as they were in yeah. the, when they were adults, except, um, you know, obviously one change led them yeah. to uh to win which honestly like r regardless of naruto as a whole that scene like that fight scene and the like final fight between naruto and sasuke at the end where it's just their pride versus their pride are like in my opinion two of the best fight scenes in anime period i like, mean w let's get some credit to uh rock lee's take off the weight fight Yes, also. I think the thing for that is that for, like, I'm not just talking about, like, the visuals. I'm talking about the imagery and, like, the sentimentality and, like, Maybe the culmination of emotion and, and character arcs that both of those two fights are. Maybe there wasn't enough time investment at that point into Rock Lee as a yeah, character. That's, but that's he was the doofiest looking character in that yeah. show. He was absolutely yep. the stupidest looking one up to that point, maybe except for the fat guy. But at the same time, he still didn't look as stupid as Rock Lee. And for yep. Rock Lee to just drop some weights, and you're like, oh, <laughs> I had the same reaction when I was growing up. I was like, oh, oh, he's just taking off some weights. <gasps> Boof. Oof. Makes two actual <laughs> craters dropping the weights. So, like, I think that the and Rock Lee still fight in losing. a vacuum. Yeah. I think that the Rock Lee fight in a vacuum is better. It, but with, like, the Obito versus Kakashi and the Naruto versus Sasuke fights at the end, I think what makes them so good is that when you actually have followed the whole series through, and I did, like, I read the, I read the manga all the way through to completion, and, like, when I was a kid and started reading in Shonen Jump was when that was when that uh, Junin exam was happening. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so like the Rock Lee fight in the manga was like maybe like my fifth or sixth volume, or, or my fifth or sixth uh copy of Shonen Jump I'd ever read. So like I watched it all the way, I read it all the way through, and then I watched some of like some of the like. I didn't really watch the anime that much, but I did watch certain scenes that were recommended to me, including those ones. Mm -hmm. And, like, just, like, when you follow the whole thing through and seeing these character arcs, seeing these character arcs just collide in these final moments that are so beautifully choreographed and designed and the music just adds to the emotion, it's something that... I feel like takes full it, it's like what we talked about with like mm. Dark Souls in the last podcast. It takes full advantage of the medium of not only just the visuals and the sounds and the choreo and the choreography, but also of like the of like the writing through the character arcs and throughout the entire and the entire progression of the story up until this point. It just created this like very magical moment that in the context of like the whole story was incredibly powerful. Mm. Which, unfortunately, is something that you'll, you won't really be able to experience unless you know the story of Naruto all the fucking way through to, that, to those endpoints. And I will never recommend to anyone that they should pick up Naruto. <laughs> the only other fight that I remembered really well uh, was, I believe the guy's name was Haru. Uh, mirror boy. Yeah. Looked like a girl. Yeah, no, the moment when, uh, what's his face? Seven Swordsman. Yeah, and then the guy, guy with the, the big sword. Yeah, with the big shark skin sword. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, the, that's no, the that, only fight I remember from Naruto. Yeah, that one was very. I remember that being one of my f first moments as, like, a very numb emo kid, like, feeling pangs of, oh my god, feels, was when, was in that scene where he get, where he sacrifices himself for Haru. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway. Arcane, <laughs> real good. <laughs> yeah. Music's good I think... in Arcane. I did I you know what I don't necessarily like Imagine Dragons. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm an Imagine uh, Dragons fan. Either, but... but I never skipped that OP. <laughs> not once. We skipped it pretty much every time, personally. Really? No. Nah. Jenny just Jenny really doesn't like Imagine Dragons. Oh wow, really? Yeah, I I mean I think the OP is really good, but yeah, Jenny just doesn't like Imagine Dragons, so we skipped it most of the time. Okay. Um Oh, yeah, other than the one time where, like, the intro was different, because, like, it led into, like, the beginning of the episode, mm -hmm. um, which I think was the one where, I don't remember which one it was, I remember there was one where, like, they changed up the OP, though, to, like, kind of lead nicely into the actual story itself. I'm pretty sure that was episode eight. Was it the one? No, I don't think, that wasn't the one where, I thought it was like, the one where they introduced Savika. I thought they, it was the one where they introduced Echo, but... Uh, it might have been actually, yeah. No, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, you're right. It was episode eight. Because I, yeah, cause I thought they, they like set Echo. up the whole, you know, yeah. the fire lights thing, and they showed everybody, and I thought that's how it opened. But yeah, no, that that does that sounds right. I've only watched through it once while also kind of dancing through some clips before this podcast to kind of remind myself of some stuff. But yeah, I, I could have probably watched. I I mean, I I would probably watch it again. The um yeah. the other uh, the only other thing that really struck no, really stuck with me, and one Victor is a character. Yeah, I I, I, I had never I so never hard. looked into Victor as a character. Well, Victor's lore that wasn't Victor's lore. There's another thing about the Redcons like that is not Victor's lore. Well, whatever the, the fuck that is, it's yeah. good. So <laughs> yeah, it was really good, but like Victor's lore was literally, oh man, machines better than people because they don't have because they have less margin for error and don't make as many mistakes. We should be machines. Haha. -ha. I'm machine now. Hey you, crippled kid, you're a machine now. I help people by making them machines. Like that's basically his fucking backstory. I think there's maybe something in his backstory where he did canonically meet up and like work with jace but they met at a progress day it didn't have anything to do with like their linked backstory like in this one if yeah, i'm remembering yeah, correctly I'll, I'll like just that, say this. that that's who, fucking who, victor's let normal, me just say, like original backstory let me just say i don't give a shit what victor's normal backstory is yeah this is the better one <laughs> exactly and I, that's and why I i'm saying like i hope they make this the they just make a statement this is the canonical lore because it's so much better than most of the characters actual lore but um the line he has well one the uh what is, do they call it dramatic irony where like a story is paralleling itself uh i don't remember the term for it but basically where the the scene where 
um, Jace stops Victor from committing suicide. Yes. You know, it's, um, and he says the line in the pursuit of great oh, a callback. What is it called? I, I know what you're talking about. In, in right, the sorry, pursuit continue. of great, we failed to do good, and we have to make Ooh. it right. Um, I, 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 oh, I've never had a tattoo before, but I, I, something about that line. We, we yeah. in the pursuit of great, we failed to do good. I kind of yeah. want that as a tattoo. <laughs> It's a really, it's a really good line. Like I want it on my arm, and I thought about doing like a sub goal or something. Like if we hit this goal, I'll fucking get a tat, my first tattoo, and I'll stream it. Yeah, <laughs> I will say. I think the Jason Victor storyline was better than the Jinx and Vi one. To be completely honest, oh. despite that being the central one. God, um, dude. I... <sighs> as a pairing, I think that they were the best pairing in the game out of any of the character pairings yeah they had the best de they had the best development and arcs and yeah i liked the caitlin vi yeah. storyline a little bit better than the vi I mean, that's jinx I, I just yeah, kept no, screaming exactly. like, like the vi, the vi just... jinx one was very i'm like dude just talk to it was your a fucking nuanced. sister it wasn't that and it also just wasn't that nuanced just talk and to like, your fucking sister, bro. I'll be honest. I love Vi as a character. She was one of my favorite characters back when I did play League of Legends. She was one of my least favorite characters in this in this series. Just, she's like, she's like, they're like on the bridge, and she's taking Caitlyn away. And she's like, look, I'm I just turn around, and be like, I'm coming back for you. She's injured. I love you both. You're very important to me. Please just stay here. I'm gonna get her off of this bridge before she dies. But that's also part of Vi's character. She's not good at communicating. That's established from the beginning true, through to the true. end. She's she she talk with fists. She doesn't talk with words. Choose choose whether you want me to sit in the Jinx chair or the or the powder chair. L listen, I love you both. You're very important to me. Please just sit and we can talk. You're hearing no. voices right now. Listen to literally no one but my voice. Literally see, no see, one. See, <laughs> you're going under the assumption that Vi's brain isn't shaped like a wrinkled fist. <laughs> because her brain is shaped like a wrinkled fist. <laughs> Just fucking Can she punch it? Yes, she can solve the problem. Can <laughs> she not punch it? She cannot solve the problem effectively. Just talk to your fucking sister. She dumped her stats in diplomacy for more punch. <laughs> yeah, no. Like, I mean... Oh god. I I did like the Caitlyn Vi dynamic quite a bit. Everybody but... loves the fucking brothel scene. Everybody's all Yeah. Oh yeah. With a little little gimpy oddle. Yeah. Just just strutting around doing his thing. <laughs> but like that being said, like and with like for me I found that Jace the Jace Victor storyline was like kind of the best pairing of characters in the mm -hmm. series mm -hmm. and one of the better storylines. In my opinion, just because of the nuance that went into it, like the Jinx Vi one kind of lacked nuance. The Vi Caitlyn one was good, but it's pretty much it's pretty much your like very typical, relatively unnuanced. Oh, a rich girl who cares about people sees how fucked up shit is below her that she never knew about. Ooh, oh, you you don't have parents. Vi is like no fucking shit. Like it, it was, it was, it was a good. It was good. It's just a story that's been told before. I feel like the Victor. Jace one had a lot more interesting nuance to it. Mm. I I'm like, glad that there was no uh queer bait in it. For yes. like I I never got the feeling that oh yeah they're totally hinting that Jason Victor gonna fuck like this was just yes. total intellectual now, pure, Vi, on the other hand <laughs> yeah intellectual peer bro stuff and I yeah. really appreciate that because. I often get really, I, I get, I, I'll, I'll put myself on blast. I often get unreasonably annoyed at people who are like, ah, oh, these two male characters shared five seconds of screen time. Well, they sure are gay. Like, yep. it, I'm like, yeah, sure. Naruto and Sasuke have like some rant just to go back into Naruto. I was like, yeah, they have some like, but like. And I with, mean, in like this... the second volume, they accidentally kiss. Like, right. It's it's not like it was on an it was on an unintentional tension. But... Right. So, but it's like with this, I would be genuinely like, there's there's no way. How the fuck do you ship these two characters? No, together? absolutely. <laughs> they, fuck, they are I, total... fuck, I'm convinced Victor's. I'm convinced Victor's ace. Yeah. 
Like, Jace clearly isn't, despite Ace being in his name. But Victor, I'm pretty convinced, is Ace. Um, I Maybe, or at least Arrow. Yeah, okay, or Arrow, for sure. But, um, or Gray, Arrow. Yeah. Very, at the very maybe, least. Maybe Gray's better, I don't know, yeah. Because he did seem to care about the girl, but yeah. maybe that was more from, like, a professional standpoint. Yeah, from a professional standpoint, very possibly. Um, yeah, I don't know, he just seems like the type that is too invested in other things to worry about relationships in any way, or be, have, it, it's so, it's so low on his priority list that he might not be fully ace, Same. But, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I think one of the beautiful Same. parts of the Victor Jace storyline, too, is that moment where they both have to grow up, but they do so in such, they do so in such divergent ways, because, mm-hmm. like, Leading up to all of like all, to leading up to that moment, they both like they're both like you know the starry eyed geniuses who want to make the world the better place. They're idealists. They're like they're very talented idealists who are like doing so much good. And then they both have to grow up. Victor because he's about to die and he has to figure out a way to he has to figure out a way to survive so that he can keep moving so that he can keep you know he can actually do the good he wanted to do and jace because he he gains so much power he has to deal with politics now Mm -hmm. like they both grow they both have that moment of where they kind of they diverge because they both have to grow up and them growing up no longer really runs in parallel with each other yeah yeah no i i i I think the um then of course there's the um girl whose name i can't remember I remember her mom's name. <laughs> or wait, no, is her is, is which, okay, which one's Mel? Mel? Mel's the one that Jace bangs. Okay, so it is. Okay, so I do remember her name. There's Mel and then there's actually step on me, mommy. <laughs> right. Right. That that was <laughs> Anyways, uh, oh, I think one of my favorite one of my favorite references to her is in uh, Magic Cop Use Fly. I watched. I also watched through Magic Cop Use Fly's like explanation of the whole series, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and when he's talking about the scene where she gets out the bath, he's like, and then and then Mel's mom steps out the bath and shows her and shows her boobs to her boobs to Jace as a as a show of dominance. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So something interesting at the end. Um, so, just, so we can move forward in a direction because I think we're just gonna circle jerk ourselves about Arcane. Yeah. Uh, at the end, uh, Mel had the the shining armor thing, and yes, that was very strange. And I mean, somebody had to take time to animate that, so obviously yes. intentional. And she took off the ring as well. Right. right. So some moment. people are thinking that maybe like this is going to set up uh, so, like the Iron Solari, the Solari. Yep, that's possible. I I mean, and then maybe theory, this uh, that maybe Mel will be a new support character. Yeah, I was about to say like the theory that the theory that I've heard posited that I kind of lean towards is the idea that Mel is a mage of some kind. Mm hmm. Uh, and that's, is a mage of some kind, what with the glowing, and also they kind of show a scene, they kind of show a scene right before that, which she kind of spidey senses the actual rocket coming. Well, okay, so, to be fair, when she turned around, that goddamn rocket was in the window, so. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, before she turns around, she spidey senses and turns around. Yeah. So, like, it, I don't know, I think. Well, she, her back was facing the rocket, and also everybody was in front of her looking at at the window so Fair. it could have also just been Fair. what the fuck is that <laughs> it just seems like her being a mage might be a good way for them to make sure that you know jace and make sure that jace doesn't fucking die from the rocket yeah without, well i mean that, and that's what we we're talking just, about you know, her being armor a support, reasons um like a like a support like a tanky support or something where she protects everybody yeah from the thing but yep for sure it's possible um, but yeah, um, I think the last thing I want to talk about arcane wise was just that was just like I've been thinking about this a lot because like I was as I was saying like Jace and Victor are my favorite pairing in the game. Oh, sorry, in the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my favorite individual character was definitely Silco. Yes, like it was a hundred percent Silco, and I've just been thinking about 
how if you reframe the show, like in like you reframe the sh you reframe the show towards Silco being a protagonist, you could make a strong argument that he's a tragic anti-hero. Mhm. Mm because like at the at the very least from at the very least from like episode 4 through to 9, he very much has a pretty typical tragic hero uh, plot line where a tragic hero being defined by a tragic hero being defined by, you know, they're they'll they're someone of like higher of like great status or wealth or in a great place. Right. And then they have a and then they have a tragic flaw. And they have they have a tragic flaw and they have an unflinchingly unchanging tragic flaw. Like a big part of the whole of like the classic tra tra tragedy formula is that the is that the tragic hero doesn't change. They don't develop, right? Like, they, they don't change, and their floor is what ultimately causes their hamatia, which is the tragic era of judgment that causes their downfall. Uh-huh. And then, uh... And then they... And that leads to the para... To the, what? The parapatia, I think it's called? Which is where the... Which is where, uh, the reversal of... Which turns into the reversal of fates, which is, like, the downslide into eventually, generally, their death. Um... And to the complete downfall... And Silco's arc, you know, starting off as like this, as like this crime lord who has helped the lanes rise up from like the shit they were in before to actually being more thriving, to having more money, to actually having like having so much profit that they ha that he has chem barons who handle different districts or areas or industries or whatever, right? Right. Like rising up to that point from where they were before. I mean, there's even in the scene with the chem barons where he's like, you know, throwing down the toxic gas that he's the only one not coughing to it. Being like, do you like, did you forget where we came from? Did you forget how they used to put us in those mines where like the toxic fumes would like choke out your breath? Right. Like he's at this high point now and then like. His tragic flaw progressively causes him to slide further and further down, and I think part of the brilliance of Silco's writing is that you is that they kind of they kind of like make is they made at least they made me think that initially it was going to be you know his pride that was going to be his downfall, right? Because that's more that, that's the more typical like that's the more typical uh tragic flaw characteristic or like characteristic of a tragic hero is that a pride is a downfall, and then like each moment. Each moment you think he's gonna be like a real fucking bastard, right? Or each moment that you think that he's that his pride is gonna be his downfall, it's not. He's calculated and he understands, and he's, in my opinion, never excessively cruel. Right. He's only ever cruel because it's a means to an end, and he's never excessively so. Like right. he could have just killed a bunch of the Ken Barons at that meeting. He could have. He could have tortured them a lot more but the only one he really tortured fully he like he actually like drew it out for was the one who you know later decided to try to throw a coup at him yeah and like he's never excessively cruel but he uses cruelty as a means to his ends and his ends is a genuinely noble goal which is actual independence and sovereignty for these downtrodden people being abused by a much much richer upper class by this one percent that lives above them mm -hmm. um and as things progress, you realize you start to realize that his tragic floor isn't his pride, it's not his cruelty, it's not it's not his violence, it's not any of these typical villain vil, uh, villainy traits. His tragic floor is his is his devoted, unchanging love to Jinx. See, I and I disagree. Oh, well, I guess I anticipated that this was going to be something that happened to him, sure, because. It was very clear that he was hurt by Vander's betrayal, his brother's betrayal. Yes. Yep. And I think losing his brother kind of left a hole to be filled by Jinx yeah. to have the family. And I guess, yes, you could anticipate like, yeah, he was probably going to just abuse her and whatever, but... The the I mean, idea very clear. It, he was yeah. obviously a very family oriented person, yeah, in kind of the criminal enterprise kind of way, but right. Yeah. And then, you know, you you, you die for your about family and whatnot. And, you know, it's, it's like what Vander said. You know, the Vander things like no matter what happens, yeah. you protect the family. See, I think the thing for me was that like 
Hey guys, Jinx here. So in the upcoming clip, I accidentally spoil something about Boku no Hero Academia, also known as My Hero Academia Season 3. So if you haven't seen that yet and you are watching the show, then I guess skip ahead. The time stops on screen. I was kind of expecting them to go the Boku no Hero, uh, Boku no Hero Academia route, where, uh, what's it, all for one? Like, raises uh, All Might's, he, like, what's, there's the reveal that, like, uh, the I touch things and they turn to dust guy is All Might's mentor's son. And All for One basically picked him up and raised him as a way to spite, like, spite All Might's mentor and spite All Might. Gee, thanks and for the spoiler, dick. <laughs> lol. Wait. That's like well past in the that's like well past in the anime, I thought. I, I had fucking no idea. And I've seen Yeah, they I, I haven't seen this season. You saw this you, you saw the scene where like the you saw the scene though where like All Might's like All Might beats him, right? All Might beats all for one, right? Yeah. In their conversation afterwards he mentions that. Hmm. Yeah. That was like season two or something. Spoilers. It was kind of like a passing conversation, so it may not have registered, but like that's... Okay, so sorry. Spoilers for Boku no Hero Academia 2, my bad. Oh, season two, my bad. But yeah, like I was expecting it to go more down that route. And like you see him manipulating Jinx throughout the whole thing, right? You're like, oh, he's manipulating Jinx because he needs her to build a weapon and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like his death, his like death scene where he's where he's talking to Jinx kind of recontextualizes all of that. Because if you go back and look at all the times he tried to manipulate Jinx, you could make a very strong argument that he's that anything he's saying is to protect her. And like in the final scene where in the final scene where like J where Vi is trying to talk to Jinx and trying to be like you know your powder come back to me blah blah blah, he he's like trying to like shout over her and argue with her and like. And like also try to talk to Jinx, but the the moment where he actually starts getting incredibly restless and angry and manages to shake himself from his binds is when what Vi is saying is causing Jinx very visible harm. Mm -hmm. Like it's causing it's triggering her so hard that you can see Jinx is having a real fucking like episode from it, and that's and that's what triggered him to actually struggle and actually manage to get free and try to point the gun at the. Who I am assuming he's pointing the gun at Vi. They kind of leave it up to interpretation, but I assume he's pointing it at Vi. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know he gets shot and blah 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 blah. Um, but like, I felt to me that final moment where he's like, you know, I never would have given them up to you. You're perfect. Blah blah blah. Kind of recontextualizes all the things he's done throughout the story. Because you, if you, because if you know that and you know that that's how he actually feels, every moment you go through where he's like manipulating jinx he's only ever manipulating jinx to keep her to keep her happy and stable and safe mm. because he knows that he knows that if he meets up with vi it's going to be incredibly incredibly painful for her and it is and that vi trying to turn her back from jinx to powder is incredibly painful for her and not even necessarily something she wants i mean at the very end she says you know i was that I was hoping that you could still love me the way you used to, even though I've changed. And Vi doesn't. See, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that what she turned into was good necessarily. I but. don't even know. There's something that I I noticed a lot, and I wonder if they're gonna roll with this, or if it was just a, a an accidental design choice. But. Uh, Medarda shows up and it's actually kind of unexplained why she shows up and it's very odd that she shows up, but they don't really talk about it. She's from Noxus. Yeah. Why the fuck is she showing up to Noxus? You know, she, she explains how, oh yeah, they're trying to start a war and all oh, no, 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 this and that, the other thing, but that just seems. So there's always Ravens following Jinx around. Yeah, always Ravens following Jinx around. And we do know that Swain can communicate and influence through Ravens. Yeah. Through and very Swain. long distances. Yep. And perhaps he saw a little bit of what was going on, stirred the pot a bit in order to give Noxus an advantage. That is not a thing I had thought about, but definitely makes sense. 
and would have maybe tipped uh, Medarda to go to Piltover to kind of help get things rolling, I guess. Yep. I mean, she definitely, I mean, they definitely heard about Hextech because of the Hextech gates, right? Right. So that would definitely make a lot of sense. Either way, um, for season two, because uh, obviously there is a season two, they've confirmed that it's yeah. in production. Um, I was actually hoping that they would do this like episode one or two, but I, I think it's pretty obvious they're going to go in the direction of Noxus. Um, I, or if they don't personally, what I would like to see is, um, Noxus being covered at some point following Riven's rise and fall in the military, uh, her journey into, uh, Ionia and the interaction between Riven and Yasuo is what I, is what I would like to see explained. Especially, and so then Yasuo's, obviously singed. Yasuo's betrayal of his, uh, his brother and just that kind of that whole story. I kind of personally for season two, I don't want them to introduce too many new characters. Well, if because if, there's still so much to explore with the cast they have, I do kind of agree on the Riven thing just because of how intricately linked Riven's backstory is to Singed, and Singed is in in the show already. Right. If it needs and to be season very clearly three, gonna have Warwick in the next season. Right. If it needs to be season three, whatever. But yeah, eventually I want the direction. If, if if I had to pick the next main sure. story shift, it would be uh, Riven and Yasuo because Yasuo is obviously one of the most popular characters in League of Legends ever. Um, yeah, and if you're gonna pick any region, and he to has kind a, of act as sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say he has a really vague backstory that kind of alludes to Riven and Riven also has a very interesting backstory as somebody who rose up into a high ranking military saw that it was fucking bullshit what Noxus was doing and then left yep. so there's just a lot of really interesting stories that happen in that small little circle that I think would make really good yeah. character driven drama also, if you're going to pick any of the, like, the different regions or nations to kind of focus a story on and to explore the rest of the setting, Noxus is the best one. Because mm, a lot of the like politics of the other regions, like Ionia and Damasia and even the Froyor to some extent, is, uh, is pretty... are all linked to Noxus in some way. Right, and because then like once they do Noxus, and Ionia have they less can do interaction. Demacia. Yeah, but like all, like the other regions might have a little less interlinking with each other, but like everyone's involved with Noxus in some way. Mm. Mostly because Noxus is fucking invading everywhere. But <laughs> right, yeah, and then once they mostly once, because they're the Fire Nation. But yeah, yeah, and then if once they do Noxus, and then like that kind of story, I would like to see, obviously I'd like to see them go into Demacia and get Garen and Lux and. Yeah, for me, they would like, probably have to I, throw Ezreal in there, I guess, because apparently Lux and Ezreal are. <laughs> yeah, for me, are, like are season two, definitely. I love that voice Lol. line. <laughs> yep, but for me, like, okay, so for me, season two, like I said, I wanted this to just continue with what they have right here because there's still a lot left unexplored and a lot left unexplained. Like, obviously, they're gonna do a thing with Warwick. Like, yeah, they have to make I, Victor transition into Victor. Yeah, they make Victor transitions into Victor. They're going to do something with Warwick. Jinx and Vi storyline aren't done yet. Like, Vi is not yet, you know, a Piltover enforcer or whatever they decide to retcon her lore into. She's not actually partners with Caitlyn yet. Caitlyn is not the sheriff yet, yada yada. There's all this stuff that has to be, like, explored as well. But there's also just a lot that I want, I hope they explore too. Largely, like, the whole Vander and Silco thing. Because there's a few details in there that make, that really make me feel like they need to explore it a bit more. Like, what co What was the betrayal that... What was the reason why Vander tried to kill Silco? Because, like, I feel like a lot of people's... At least my first instinct was, oh, it's because, like, the, the like, attempt at a revolution to cross the bridges failed so horribly. But if you look back at the scenes where, uh, between, like, Vander... Uh, between Vander and Silco where they're going into the past where he's drowning him, 
if you pay, if you know, if you pay attention and slow down the and slow down the frames, Vander doesn't have any facial hair in that scene. Mm -hmm. In the scene where he's drowning Silco, he doesn't have any facial hair. And in the scene after the failed uprising happens at the beginning of episode one, where he picks up Jinx and oh, he picks up Powder and Vi. Vander has facial hair and he looks visibly older. He has more wrinkles that he doesn't have seen, which means Vander betrayed Silco before the uprising happened. Did he betray and... him or did Silco betray Vander? Uh, who fucking knows? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, there's so there's. If they didn't put that detail in there, I'd just be like, okay, cool. We can just brush that off. You know, something happened. We can leave it vague. But the fact that they put the detail in there that Vander was younger then was younger when he when he tried to kill Silco means there's a lot more to tell there. And the fact that they and they included that detail and I feel like they had to have included it for a reason. Yeah. So yeah, I would I would like to see that explored a little bit more, which I think they probably will because like I mean like this is still technically a theory, but like I feel like it's pretty much confirmed Vanda's gonna be Warwick. No, it's um I mean I would say it's it's pretty much it's confirmed. It's basically confirmed. He's hanging in Singe. He's hanging in Singe's with a lab bunch of fur on him, with yeah. claws and fur. Yeah, exactly. He also, and like, Warwick also we, we see has the, we see the back of his we see the back of his head. But yeah, exactly. And like Warwick's backstory is that you know he he was some guy who put he was some big tough thug in Zorn who put down his who decided to put down his like weapons and whatnot and live a more peaceful life and then Singe decided to experiment on him and blah 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 all that stuff so like it's pretty it's basically fucking confirmed that Vanda's gonna be Warwick so I'm hoping that you know through Warwick's introduction in season two they can explore the they can maybe show some like you know snapshots or like go or like show him like remembering things or something and explain a bit more of the Silco and Vanda storyline because <clears throat> Silco's dead at this point so like it's gonna have to come from the Vanda side of things um, Did they ever explain the eyeball? The eyeball? Yeah. Yeah, it's because of the river toxins. Why does he have to pop it? Inject it? That is def That is up to... That is a question. That's it's made of glass. His eyeball? Yeah, like there's a, there's a cracking Silco's sound. Eyeball? Yeah. It's not made of glass. Well, it's, it's, just it's, it's just poison. I don't... I think he uh, didn't. He have his eyeball replaced. There's a cracking sound every There's time no she scene hits where it. Where his eyeball was replaced. Yeah, I mean, it might be like more. It might be like denser or something. Uh -huh. I'd I'd have to re-listen through because I don't remember that being necessarily a cracking sound, just more of like a popping sound. So I'd have to re-listen through to be sure. But like, I mean, it's possible it's like denser or something. But I mean, and they don't explicitly explain it. Just my interpretation of it was that you know. Vanda tried to drown him in the try to drown him in the river and he talks about how he talks about you know feeling the river toxins like uh like the feeling the river toxins course through your body or whatever right so my assumption was just that okay well Vanda tried to drown him in a fucking toxic river and probably the stream was you know I'm pretty sure in that scene the stream is going downstream so it would go into the left side of his face so that's why the left side of his face is fucked up because he got a heavy dose of river toxins into his eye and my assumption was he has to inject Shimmer into it because of some medical reason. Because, like, we see I, that Shimmer can he, be used No, is he even injecting Shimmer in there? It's purple, I, I so I assume so. When they put the thing together, they never show that there was Shimmer in it. It's just that it stabbed his eye. I don't know. but I remember that being purple involved with it. So well, yeah, well, his eye turned eye. purple, but yeah, I never saw them shimmer put Shimmer... Eyes. No, I never saw them put yeah. Shimmer in... The thing. Hmm. It's hmm. like they, they show them assembling it. And there's never shimmer involved. They show them assembling it, but like the vial is like covered. You can't see exactly what's in it, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, they've never showed they never showed shimmer in it, as far as I saw. I, I'm I'm like looking up the scene real quick now, because now now I need to I remember there being purple involved. Which means that it's shimmer because everything fucking purple in this setting is shimmer apparently, and we also know that we also know for a fact that uh, shimmer can be used medically because <laughs> when the creepy lady gives the potion to Caitlyn, she puts a drop of shimmer into it to make a health potion. Yeah. 
So like we know that's the case. Wait, does that but... mean that all the health potions in League of Legends are just shimmer? <laughs> okay, yeah, no, it's definitely shimmer because like when I'm just looking at the scene right now, when she injects it into Selko's eye, it not only turns it purple, there's purple droplets coming off of it, and then purple runs down his face. A okay. purple a, like a tear of purple runs down his face. I was just so thought that it meant he was crying shimmer. Um, I mean, that's possible, I guess, but you, s I don't know. I, I guess I just, to me, it, I felt like, yeah. the, I felt like they would, if they're going to, if they're going to show that it's, well, I mean, why not just show that there was shimmer in it? Like, you know, it, there's, there's no, they, they assemble it. So why not show that he's putting shimmer into the thing? I, I feel like that's a really weird detail to leave out. Yeah, that's fair. I'm watching them like assemble it real quick. And they show them assembling it two or three times, and they never show that they put Shimmer into that device. It, it just seems more like it's a thing. The only time they assemble it though is eye. like, the only time they assemble it though is like sticking the is sticking the thing on it that lets it position over his eye properly. Yeah. They never like put a vial into it or anything. I guess you're right. That's a weird detail to leave out. But I guess to me, it just always kind of seemed. Like, it was just a shimmer. It, it was some kind of special shimmer thing. Okay. So, kind of basically, it was never explained fully. Thing. So Yeah, never explained. I mean, that's kind of this show, is that... Maybe we'll get some of the backstory yeah. uh, of after Soko gets drowned, and we'll see if there was a, some kind of thing. Season yeah, two. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they very clearly don't explain a lot of things fully, because they probably want people to have these kinds of discussions, because that just raises more hype for the show, you know? Yeah. It's often intentional writing is leaving shit like that out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but as far as, uh, I mean, that's my expectations for season two is I just hope they uh, show the Victor process. Uh, Warwick, probably more singed. Uh, somebody was talking about how singed, 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 that's a hard one to say. Uh, singed, yeah. singed daughter um, might be Oriana. I'm um, yeah. The, the <clears throat> hairstyle is too on point for it to not be. Uh, so that might be a thing that comes in. And that I might was actually, actually thinking also that the, Victor's backstory. Well, I was almost even thinking, yeah, that might be Victor. And uh, I was almost thinking at one point because he talked about his daughter. I had thought that the the specimen was his daughter. <laughs> Lol. I mean, that's not an unfair assumption to make until they show him looking in the locket. Right, right, right. <laughs> that, that was my, yeah. I was like, oh God, is the thing your daughter? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very convinced that that's Oriana and that it's going to be linked to, they, they still have to figure out how to transition Victor into his mechanical state, right? Mm -hmm. And into his, into his like me mechanical obsession, because that hasn't happened yet. Like right now he's kind of, he's obsessed with Hextech and whatnot, and that has to transition into machines at some point. Mm -hmm. And Oriana is a machine, and he's already he's already tied with Singe, so he's probably gonna be involved in some way. Right, right. Uh, you know, I thought it might be funny to, because I mean they 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 do say they do mention Oriana's dad in the lore, but I encourage them to change the lore. <laughs> I mean they're already changing a lot anyway, so they might as well. Yeah, I think one <coughs> other just one other quick thing I was. I, one interesting detail I noticed uh, that I was thinking about when I was kind of thinking about of this whole seeing Silco as like a tragic anti-hero mm -hmm. instead of as a villain because he's to me he is written much more as a tragic anti-hero than a sympathetic villain right um, if you reframe the story and kind of made the Piltovans seem more like the Undercity views them right and see them as like these horrible rich oppressors who just abuse and who abuse and take advantage of the Undercity for their own profit sort of thing if you can, if you were to reframe the Piltovans as that, you could very much write. Uh, you could very much tell the story from uh, as Silco being a tragic antihero. But like one interesting thing I was thinking about was like, well, he has child labor in his Shimmer Factory. That's bad by default, right? But when you look at the actual scene in the Shimmer Factory, there's never anything to suggest that any of the workers are in any way like abused or taken advantage of. Well, uh, I mean, I fact, have to assume they're not being abused or taken advantage of, considering one of the Kem Baron's, yeah, the Kem Baron's son. sons works there. Yeah works exactly there. so like i mean don't get me wrong like child labor is still child labor if you look at it from a modern lens right but if you look at this from a lens of like an industrial revolution sort of thing i mean we we had much worse working conditions in america for children during the industrial revolution than they 
than was apparent in what they had there. On top of that, the kids were actually trying to fight back from the enforcers and resisting. And like, I just, I, I guess I found that to be an interesting I, detail. I, I, I think it's funny. As you said, we, industrial revolution, we. <laughs> the business shit America. happened in England. That had nothing to do with USA, baby. <laughs> Sorry, in England. But I mean, that there's also, the U, there's also the USA child labor stuff in history as well, factory wise and whatnot. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's yeah, I'm just, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I thought that was an interesting thing, that was an interesting thing to see in the scene, because there's an argument you could make of that, you know, they might view a child working in, like, one of those, like, in one of those shimmer factories as similar to, like, a child helping out with, like, a business at home or something. Right. Where, like, this is just them contributing, but they're not being necessarily abused or... They're not necessarily being abused in like or taken advantage of in that sense. Especially because like there's that final scene where Jace like looks up from the dead kid and sees all the other kids up there. And you don't it's not like you see like a bunch of kids who like he just saved or something. You see a bunch of kids terrified of him. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, he did just murder a kid. Yeah, exactly. And realize and Jace realizing, okay, maybe I'm not necessarily doing an like doing an objectively good thing here. <laughs> The only other, uh, wait, what? I totally lost my train of thought. He's gay. Uh, oh, right. We were going to have a discussion about, uh, whether Vander and Silco had the same goals. You don't think they did. Uh, I think they yeah. do. I think they, that the they goal originally was the, did, but well, yeah, the go goal ahead. was the freedom of Zahn. But it's just Vander saw what happened at the bridge, realized that if they do it, they're going to be killing a lot of people to gain their freedom. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people will die by the time that they gain their freedom. So it's, do you want to do that to kill thousands of people to gain your freedom? Or do you just want to deal with what you've got now? It's not the greatest. In fact, it's utter, it's ob objectly shit, but at least it's functioning. But nobody dies. Because you look at yeah. you look at the, the lanes, yeah, it was seedy, but I believe the the difference between the most well off in the lanes and the worst off in the lanes was very close. It was a very there was almost a parody between them. I mean, everything was you, everybody was objectively in the shit, but at least they were all relatively close. In we Silco don't Zon, necessarily know that because we only ever see we the top level of the lanes. We saw a lot of, of back lanes. alley shit. We saw a lot of random stuff. In but the top from, level of the lanes. From what we saw. The other city is much bigger than just the lanes. I know, but what was shown, it seemed like there was a lot more disparity between the richest in Zon and the poorest in Zon under Silco. Yeah, there were definitely more. There were yeah, can, definitely. Can you I stop mean, the clap? It's really loud. The what? Sorry. The clap is. Really oh, is loud. it really? Sorry, yeah, I didn't. I forgot you had sound on. Yeah. Um, my bad. <laughs> but yeah. Uh. I think it's something that isn't well explored enough. Because like, they refer to so like the lanes is that top level area of zone right where they all live and everything like that. And we know that there's further levels down. We know that there's mining of some kind happening, meaning there has to be other areas as well where the mining and the fi happened and the fissures were at. Mm -hmm. And maybe the lanes is just the residential district. Maybe the lanes is like a topper level of the zone of the Undercity because they distinctly refer to the lanes and the Undercity as separate things throughout the series. Mm -hmm. As in the Undercity is more the whole and the lanes is like specifically that part of the Undercity. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I interpreted it. Um, so... It's hard. There, there is definitely a more. I mean, Vi even mentions that you know, like the bottom area where the people are forgotten, that where the forgotten go. There's never been this many people there before because there's all these shimmer addicts and everything who end up over there. Yeah, there's a literal heroin yeah. epidemic. Yeah, exactly. There's a literal heroin epidemic, um, and that, like, that's that area has definitely gotten bigger. But at the very least, of what they show us of the lanes, it's much more thriving under Silco. But that's but, what I'm, that, that's what I'm saying yeah. though, is there is much 
there's a much bigger disparity. That's not necessarily true. How can it not be true? There's people who are driving around going to clubs under Silco. The best, the richest it, under Vander was, you know, people who hung out at the bar. There's a much bigger gap. There's still a gap. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say guess, it was like a I'm perfectly straight that, line. Like, it's just instead of the... being, you know, 100 to zero like it is on right. Silco, it was more like 60 to 30. Yeah. So, like, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, it's 60 to 30, but we, we don't necessarily know if the 30 of, like, the, of, like, the lower class is higher or lower than it was before Silco. Well, I have to imagine being I don't, homeless we don't know. is better than being homeless and addicted to heroin. I mean, yes, but, like, yes, but what I'm saying is, like, the actual majority, right? We don't know if the majority's overall standard of living went up or down or not. Is what I'm saying. Yes, there are more there are more like homeless and addicted people. And there is a lot more in that absolute, absolute like bottom homeless class. But then well, that's don't not know what I was the, saying though. We don't know yeah. What what I was saying is I don't I don't whether whether the average person's went up or down, I'm not that's not what I'm saying. I'm yeah. saying there is a much larger gap between the well and the unwell. In yeah. Silco's Zon. Yeah. And I don't think that, I don't, I, I guess I couldn't see how that could be denied. Yeah, that I agree cannot be denied. I guess well, so, so the thing I was making an argument for earlier is that it seems like the, it, it seems like under Silco, the general standard of living did increase from what they did, they did show us of, so, oh, they did show us of the Undercity afterwards, after the first three episodes. I, I, I guess that would have to depend on what, A, I guess that has to, depends on what your definition of like 2077 is that is because it reminds me a lot of 2077 where like right. things are just, you know, it's partying, it's body modification, it's, you know, drugs, it's, is that a positive place to go where you're like losing your humanity and your, I mean, because basically they've turned into the people that they, you have to understand, they're basically turning into the people that they hated. They yeah. have essentially gained the wealth that they have from Piltover, even just a fraction of it. And they themselves have turned into the uncaring people who have segmented their own society and disregarded them. We never, I mean, sure, I know, I, I know it's not fully explored, but we never yeah. saw like homeless people shriveled up raisins begging for things in the street pre Silco. We never saw that. Now, again, the only time it wasn't fully those, ex explained, yeah. it wasn't fully developed. Yeah. But just from what we saw, we never saw that. Yep. Yeah, I guess it's, probably the difference between like and this this gets into a whole political debate we probably don't, w don't want to get into but it's the difference between like a more like a more communist society which is what more what vanda was producing kind of a commune sort of thing everyone's kind of around the same level versus like what happens with the capitalistic society that silco embeds uh-huh where there is more overall wealth, but there is more wealth disparity, but also but also the middle class or like the majority might also have a higher standard of living because of it. I think the thing that makes me think about is how so like in China, right? Uh in China, part of like the vast majority of China is still very rural. Uh-huh. Um, and especially for the past decade or so of them trying to like bring up the country, it has been coming less and less rural. And, like, with the whole, like, Chinese factory things from, like, I've heard a lot from people uh, from, like, a Western perspective, from people I've talked to about this and whatnot, that, you know, this kind of factory work and whatnot, like, oh, these, the, conditions are, the conditions are probably bad, like, they're bad at getting paid anything, yada, yada. But also when you look into, like, when you look into what you can research on it, because, you know, there's media control, but what you can research about it, like, a lot of these, fa like, I've 
at least I've read reports from reporters and whatnot about how when these factories move into these villages, the villagers are very happy about it because they get access to things like air conditioning and the internets and television and things that they didn't have access to before because of the fact that the standard of living and the technological and the technological standard increased from the fact from the factory moving into the town. Yeah. And I well, guess that's part of what I see with the whole with the whole Silco thing is like it like I'm not saying it's a morally good thing that there are more addicts and there's a heroin epidemic and all this stuff going on. But there is more capital in there is more capital in the lanes and like I said, the whole like means to an end thing. Silco wasn't doing this because he wanted to be a rich crime lord. He was doing it so that there would be enough of a power basis that they could actually have a war with Piltover. Mm -hmm. Or they could actually scare them enough to give them their independence. Right. They could have sovereignty and the ability to and the ability to decide their own fates. Right. Yeah. Um the only the only was with your example uh about people in the rural having things. It's kind of like yeah. what happened here, you know, when New York City and all these other big places got stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Um I can't remember which president it was, but it was the Rural Electrification Act or something, uh, yeah. something like that, where basically, you know, you got power to uh, these bumfuck, you know, uh, you know, Nebraska's and Kansas's and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, while they're getting bigger, yeah, sure, the rural areas are getting nice. You know, it's it's always been nice to live in these rural areas because they're not yeah. crowded. You can have yeah. all the land you want. You know, it's disregard that. Places like New York, where it is one giant freaking block to block city, and there's really no rural areas until you get way out of New York City, um, have created, you know, these. I mean, you look at any city, really, especially LA, where it's always nice. There's a lot of homeless yep. population there. And, yep. and like, you I see feel like this, the sorry, richest living next to homeless camps. Yeah. And I think this is, I guess that's why I specifically said the standard of living. Mm -hmm. Because, like, the average standard of living is a metric you can measure for those kinds of things. And it's one of the metrics that, you know, pro -cap like pro-capitalism people can, will quote, because it does create this increase in the average standard of living, even when you have these bigger wealth inequalities and whatnot. Right. Um, especially with, industrializ as, with industrialization, especially, versus... Uh, and having access to very and having access to like actual technology and power and all these things, but like the argument of whether that is whether that's right, standard of living is a good thing because of the wealth inequalities, because of the disappearing middle class, because of like the more oppressed lower classes or the increase in homeless people, whether that is a happier existence than being in a simpler rural area without access to these technologies and standard of living, is a whole fuck it is an and isn't like an impossible debate, mm -hmm. I guess. Like, would you be like, is it happier to live in a rural town with that, with limited technology access versus living in versus living in New York? Like that is too subjective an argument to make, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would just basically be like a four, a four hour discussion about our opinions on it. Yeah. Because, I mean, you and I would have yeah. very different perspectives. In fact, we would have the perfect perspectives for this because I spent my entire life in the Midwest, in Nebraska, mostly. Yep. I mean, you're in Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Iowa, Illinois. Um, and you've spent nearly your entire life in Atlanta. Yeah. So you have that perspective of being in a mega city, being able to go to any club or get any single thing you want. All your vices are available for you within driving distance. And I have lived most of my life in just, you know, if something passes by, you enjoy it. You know, if a random yeah. concert comes by, you drive six hours to go see it. And, you know, a, a eight hour trip is just a normal drive to go see somebody. And, you know, just kind of chilling. But it's really nice. It's cheap. And... uh you know, it would be, it'd be an interesting conversation to have because we both yep. have pretty much the opposite uh, experience in our life. Yep. Be an interesting thing to talk about. But yeah. So yeah, Arcane, good. 
I'm just happy they're doing lots more... of debates. I'm just happy they're, they've been doing more adult animations. Oh yeah, agreed. I was also really surprised to show them actually showing a kid dying. Yeah. Um. I know. I. I mean. I mean. Just in general, I feel like yeah. the industry as a whole is has is moving is, away from, is moving away kid from the kids. yeah cartoons are not cartoons are not a genre is something i've always said cartoons are a medium, medium. to tell any story that they need to mm -hmm. um and you know i've got a bunch of really awesome stuff on my list where i know i'm talking about like american dad or family guy where it's just poop jokes and yeah you know there's adult well humor. even like american dad has a lot of like societal <clears throat> and political criticism baked into a lot of its storylines but anyway but uh you know stuff like bojack horseman um you know even and even and even shows that are aimed at kids you know yeah, Gravity Falls, really good. Uh, I've heard really good things about Amphibia. I haven't seen it yet, but I kind of I want to watch it. I've heard Amphibia is yeah. pretty good. Uh, Owl House is supposed to be really good. I've heard that one's good too. Yeah. Um, Agretsuko season Although four not, is coming up sure. uh, in less than a I'm month. I'm also still not sure if Owl if Owl House is good because it's good or good because it's gay. <laughs> I've I've heard people say it's a good story about gay. Yeah, well, that I guess that's the thing is that like every person I've heard who says it's good also is very queer, so I'm not sure if it's good because it's gay and well, it's a good step in the right direction, or if it's good because it's good. <laughs> I mean, a good queer story can be good just because it's good. Queer, oh yeah, no, like I, and I admit that, which is why I say I'm not sure which one it is because I haven't seen it. You know, would would people say Legend of Korra was half as good if Korasami didn't happen? <laughs> <laughs> We will never be yes, able to fully have this good, argument but... until I watch all of Korra. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say yes because it's such like it's an annoying detail they did it, they that they didn't let them kiss at the end. It's also not a truly fundamental enough one to ruin the series. <laughs> I just but anyway, I feel like yeah. everybody started talking about how good Korra was after Korra saw me happen. I'm like. So wait, mm -hmm. did it actually get good? Is it only good because of Korasami, or did it actually get good? Is my, was my question. See, since I watched it as it came out, to me, it got good halfway through season two, and it got really <clears throat> good in season three. Korasami was just a nice little cherry on top. <sighs> but well, I told you, you just need to find some day to make me watch well, Always Sunny, and then all, and then, then Korra, and we can just watch a bunch of stuff. And then well, I'll make you watch, um, I don't know, so I'll find some random shit. And we'll, we'll, we'll make each other watch things that we haven't watched before. Lol. But uh, Agretsuko Season 4 coming out in a couple weeks. Yes, I'm excited. I am very excited for that. That's Okay, I think it's actually been two hours now. <laughs> it's two hours in, in, just now. but Yeah, I think it just hit two hours. Anything we want to briefly talk about, I guess, before I hop off? Um, butts. Butts. Yes. Butts. Ass. <laughs> ass, 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 ass. No, I got nothing, really. I definitely have some exciting news related to ass to talk to you about, but I'm not going to do it on the podcast. Oh. This is a slip in your DMs kind of announcement, but. Oh. To, to, time to hold on. Hold on. Ass. <laughs> Ass. Actually, I'm just going to DM it to you real look, quick. Look at the stream real quick. I, don't know I see. Amazing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a blush emote. Uh, I need to unlock blush. So I'll just... Um, I'll just... Uh, fearful of the ass. <laughs> uh... I need to get more emotes for... So, so but yeah, what, what did you think about the... Uh, I mean, do you like this layout? I really like it. The, I mean, I was thinking about actually having... Um, like a Patreon tier or something... Where... You can have whatever you want... On the wall behind us. Yeah, because they got all those blank panels there. Yeah, and I can, I can zoom out a little bit. Yeah. And you can see all the blank panels... There's supposed to be um, a uh, sound uh, dampening panels, but yeah, I could but maybe have uh, 
you know, whatever you want can be on there. That'd and be then cool. the center uh, can be taken out if we wanted a guest, I guess. <laughs> Can Anything that won't get us demonetized on YouTube, yeah. I guess, is the only yeah. rule for that on the background. <laughs> yeah, no TOS. Yeah, no I, TOS. And I just need to um I need to paint these lamps above us black. They, they, they're kind of weird that they're yellow, but yeah. Looks really good though. Yeah. I like the setup. Yeah. Next time I'm hoping we can like actually start the podcast a little early a little earlier so I can give you a little tour of my island and maybe cut it together for an intro clip for the sure. podcast. Sure. But, yeah. All right. I gotta go get ready for work. You can go get ready for work. Thanks for listening to us talk about Arcane. <laughs> yeah. Next time we'll have, like, mental health stuff. Yeah, mental health talk. I've, oh, I've had this on the docket for, like, three, four weeks now. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, the past two weeks have a lot of it has been me has been like topics I've wanted to talk about though. Which is good. Yeah. I'm actually really happy about that. Because it feels like yeah. you're invested in it. I felt like I was dragging you in here to talk <laughs> about stuff that I wanted to talk about, which is kind of the topic of the next probably the next podcast, but you know I mean I don't mind that though. It's nice for me to pop in and just kind of give my two cents about things you want to talk about because I find the topics you want to talk about interesting. Jinx thinks I'm interesting. Poggies. I mean, I wouldn't be able to talk with you for two plus hours a week, and even that's not really enough time if I didn't think you were interesting, Tuner. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Uh, whatever. Okay. Whatever, He's... dude. Okay. Whatever, I... dude. <laughs> whatever. All right. So uh, I guess goodbye, YouTube frogs. Thanks for watching this VOD that will be uploaded at some point onto the YouTube channel. Uh, let us know if you Bye. liked having the sounds on, because obviously if Jinx yeah. uh, is clapping, it's loud. But <laughs> yeah, so. I will uh, keep that in mind for the next time. <laughs> yeah. And just just please give us comments if you watch this on yeah. YouTube. Please let us know. Yeah, I, leave I, a comment below about what you about how you felt about Arcane and what your favorite scene was. <laughs> and be sure to like and smash Sub that smash subscribe that button. button. <laughs> smash it. Smash it like Vice smash Caitlyn off screen. <laughs> God. All right. Right. Look, I'm not saying it's canon that they smashed off screen. I'm just saying it's my head canon they smashed off screen. <laughs> oh. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye.